I'm Ian Hanna-Mansing, and this is The National. We are covering two major stories this evening. Of course, that terrible shooting in Fredericton. We'll hear from Adrienne Arsenault, who is in New Brunswick. Uh, she'll have the latest on that in just a moment. But we want to start with a live update on a developing story here on the West Coast. It happened just south of here in Washington State, where a Horizon plane was essentially stolen by an employee at SeaTac Airport. Pierce County Sheriff's Office uh, describing that male as suicidal. He took the plane in the sky. No passengers were on board, according to uh, the Pierce County Sheriff. There were two uh, military F-15s chasing that plane. They didn't shoot it down, but it did eventually crash. We've talked to an eyewitness who saw those planes uh, pursued, the plane pursued by the jets and the crash after. So we're working on this story. We're going to have a live update for you in about 25 minutes' time. We'll continue to follow the story through the hour. But let's uh, go now to Adrian in Fredericton. <laughs> The community gathers in the face of some devastating grief. This is Fredericton tonight, and a vigil to remember four people shot and killed just this morning. Among them, two police officers. That loss of officers gunned down on duty is a tragedy this province has seen before. So we are here tonight to explore the dangers police face in their work, the lives cut all too short, and yet another Canadian neighborhood reeling from gun violence. This is The National. And that is the Fredericton apartment complex we're talking about. There's shell casing still on the ground this evening. It remains an active crime scene tonight. In this neighborhood, this city, they are all united in grief, remembrance, and a fair amount of confusion. Many community events, like an evening baseball game and a fundraiser, have been canceled or postponed out of respect. This has become a night of reflection after a beautiful day turned very dark. Shortly after 7 this morning, the crack of gunfire shattered the quiet of this place, blowing holes in windows, sending people scrambling for cover. Then about an hour later, four people were dead, two civilians and two police officers sworn to protect them. Tonight, we're trying to dig into all the angles on this story, the investigation, the community, and the many, many questions that remain. And we begin our coverage with what we know, of course, about the victims, including those dedicated police officers committed to frontline public service and all the risk that comes with it. Four people were killed, including two Fredericton police officers. 45-year-old Lawrence Rob Costello was a 20-year veteran who worked on all kinds of cases, missing persons, robberies, extortion. At one time, he was a key member of the RCMP's Internet Child Exploitation Unit. Costello posted online memorials to other officers killed on duty, including those killed in Moncton in 2014. He leaves behind a partner and four children. 43-year-old Sarah Mae Burns joined the force just two years ago. She helped raise money for Liberty Lane. That's an organization that provides housing for victims of domestic abuse. She was married and she had three kids. But we know very little tonight about the other two victims in this tragedy, a man and a woman. He has been identified as Donnie Robichaud. So tonight, there are so many of those unanswered questions. We have questions about the suspect, certainly about the gun, definitely about the motive. And so Kayla Hounsell is here now with what we know about the investigation. This North Fredericton neighborhood was quiet until just after 7 when police responded to gunfire at an apartment complex. I heard somebody scream. And then after the second one, there was no more sound. And then not too longer after that, more shots started ringing out. Officers Rob Costello and Sarah Burns were first on the scene. About an hour later, they and two other people were dead. This is the worst uh, moment for any chief of police and any police agency to have to deliver this news. Now, while a city grieves, investigators try to piece together what happened, sharing what they know this afternoon. Around 9.30, Fredericton Police Force entered an apartment and arrested a 48-year-old man from Fredericton. He was taken to the Dr. Everett Chalmers Hospital and is undergoing treatment for serious injuries. And that's about all they've said. 
The rest is part of the investigation, so I can't go too deep into it. No details on who the alleged shooter is. No, unfortunately, it's an ongoing investigation. Or the weapon used. The investigation is continuing to determine exactly what happened. The RCMP have taken over the investigation from Fredericton Police, but they too had little to offer in the way of details. Their focus now, gathering as much evidence and information as possible from the scene and from the public. I'm still lost for words. I have no, no clue what to think after seeing what I saw. It's, it's traumatizing. It's very traumatizing. And Kayla, I guess as if to underscore your point, uh, people are still not being allowed back home. That's right, Adrian. As we can see, this remains very much an active investigation tonight. Police are actually asking members of the public to submit any video or mm -hmm. any photos that they have to help them piece together what's happened here. And while this investigation continues, this stretch of road that we're on here remains closed, which means 50 people who live here cannot go home tonight. So city officials and members of the Red Cross have found places for them to stay. At least for now, it's not clear when they might be able to go home. So as they continue this work, the police are asking for patience. But Adrian, they're also thanking members of the public for the outpouring of love and support. They say they have seen here just tonight tweeting that they feel it and they appreciate it. Well, no doubt people are incredibly gracious here. I know we've, we've both seen that. Thank you very much. This sort of mayhem hits very hard in a city like Fredericton. Yes, it's a provincial capital, but it's also close-knit and so proud of its small town feel. Let's take a second to get our bearings then. The downtown area is south of the St. John River. South of there, you'll find the regional hospital where the victims were taken, but we're north of the river in what's seen as a quieter part of town. Brookside Drive is a very long street that cuts through this residential neighborhood. It's now really the focus area of this tragedy that has this entire city reeling. So here is the CBC's Harry Forstel with the impact on the community. In a place like Fredericton, people wear their hearts on their sleeves. And tonight, many of those hearts are breaking. At a vigil not far from the scene of the shooting, residents gather to comfort and be comforted, struggling, like so many here, to comprehend the horror that unfolded just hours ago. Yeah, it's quite disturbing, and all those poor people get shot. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty shocking, because you don't hear too much about uh, this stuff here in Fredericton. Nope, this is a quiet town. Nothing like this happens here. It's quite shocking, actually. At the city's main hospital, where a still unknown number of victims are being treated for injuries, uniformed police and their supporters formed an honor guard. And during this most difficult time, in this dark time, I can say with certainty that the citizens of Fredericton were being exceptionally well served and that those that were killed this morning were taken very good care of. And I couldn't be prouder of the men and women that serve the city and I want to reassure the public that we will continue to do so in the coming days and months and years ahead. Outside police headquarters, a growing tribute of flowers and messages of support meant to heal a gaping wound. We were watching this morning the events as they unfolded and our hearts are broken. I just wanted to pay our respects. This is awful. Things like this don't happen in Fredericton. But they do. And today, with his city in shock, Mayor Mike O'Brien called for unity in the face of overwhelming tragedy. In this community, we grieve together, but we'll heal together as well. Today, we saw something tragic. In the near future, we'll see the best of our community come forward. We always do. Harry, there are echoes here, obviously, of Moncton. It's impossible now uh, to talk about Fredericton without talking about Moncton. Without reference to that terrible tragedy, how could there not be uh, that on the in the backs of people's minds on a day like today of course four years ago in Moncton four RCMP off five RCMP officers shot three killed two wounded it was a terrible event not just for Moncton but for this whole province for that matter for the Atlantic region of Canada so today when we began reporting on this that was the dread that 
uh, maybe there were more. Of course, there are still people uh, injured in hospital. We have no idea what their condition is. We'll find out that in the coming days. But yes, in the backs of people's minds, that terrible tragedy in Moncton. And I think we're going to see an outpouring of support from that city, but also an outpouring of grief here as it really hits home what people have been through with this experience, Adrian. Well, you, my friend, have, have been through a lot today. We, we've watched you all, all day long. Some yeah. of those terribly poignant scenes at the hospital of, of those police officers lining and then and saluting and standing at attention when the chief arrived, yeah. waiting to address her and supporting each other. What, you know, what has struck you about this day? What you realize in the progress of events through a day like this, even as a reporter, uh, what strikes me is how this is a city with the heart of a town. This is a small, intimate place. And uh, no matter how big it gets, uh, you realize there are very few degrees of separation between people. You talk to people and they tell you, yeah, I know someone in the RCMP. You know, my brother-in-law is in the city police force. So this is close to them, too close to home. And when you see events like uh, the police officers lining up in front of the hospital, um, it's very, very emotional. People feel these events here, whereas in a much larger city, they might not. But as I say, Fredericton is a city with the heart of a town. Right. Well, this is a country of neighborhoods, too. Yeah. Too many neighborhoods Absolutely. going through this. Going through this. Thank you, Harry. Very now, beautiful. let's hear a little bit more from someone who was in the building right next door when those shots were fired. Justin McLean, he's 19. He's our witness. I was actually just sleeping in the basement and I woke up to hearing gunshots. I woke up and look out, looked outside my window and there was a cop standing there with a gun. So I just figured, I was like, okay, something's going on. Anyway, I went around my back window and looked out and I saw three bodies laying there and I was just like, holy moly, what's going on? And then they, uh, they pulled up with their armored vehicle to put the body inside of it, like get him to safety. And uh, they couldn't lift him, so I went out and tried to help them. And that's when the shooter proceeded to shoot again. And then they just threw me in and evacuated me. And I've been here ever since at Tim Hortons. So did you see the shooter? I never saw the shooter. I saw the barrel of his gun pointing out of the window. That's all I could see. Whenever police are killed in the line of duty, a, a blue ribbon is used to honor that loss. Today, it was in full view on Twitter as police forces right across this country paid tribute to Fredericton's two fallen officers. And at many police headquarters and government buildings, flags are flying at half staff. Now, today's shooting certainly illustrates just how dangerous policing can be. The call came in around a shift change. The two officers happened to be in the station. They jumped into a cruiser together, and they were the first on the scene. Now, CBC News has been looking into police deaths across Canada, analyzing 40 years' worth of data. And as Katie Nicholson tells us, to serve and protect means constantly facing the risk. Policing is a risky job. The shooting in Fredericton, a stark reminder of the dangers men and women in uniform face on the job. Now, we analyzed the data from the numbers of officers who were killed on the job in Canada since 1975. Here's what we found. Since 1975, 101 officers have been murdered on the job in Canada. In 84% of those cases, the officer was shot. And the data tells us these fatal encounters catch the officers by surprise. Most of those police officers didn't have a chance to defend themselves. Only one third drew their weapon or fired before they were killed. Among the most dangerous calls an officer can respond to, robberies. One quarter of police homicides occurred during robbery calls. And then there's domestic assault calls. They're the second most dangerous. They represent 14 of the deaths in our database. The shooting in Fredericton claimed the lives of two officers, one man and one woman. Since 1975, only four female police officers have been murdered on the job. And most of the officers who were killed on the job aren't veterans. The data tells us they have roughly eight years of experience under their belts. These are the first Fredericton police officers to be murdered on the job since 1975. Now, overall, it's the larger police forces that see the most officer deaths in Canada. The RCMP, whose members often go out on solo calls, represent nearly 30% of the officers murdered on duty in our analysis. 
So Katie joins me now. Katie, how rare are these types of police deaths? Well, policing is actually much safer than it was decades ago. In the 70s and the 80s, it wasn't uncommon to have four or more police homicides a year. Now, since the mid-90s, there tend to be one, sometimes two a year, with a few notable exceptions, where we see deadly events like the Moncton deaths or the Mayerthorpe tragedy in Alberta in 2005. Now, in the U.S., about one officer is murdered per week. Even when you adjust for population, there are are still two to three times more police homicides in the U.S. compared to Canada. But as Fredericton has shown us, tragedies still strike police in Canada, and the numbers only tell part of the story. Well, listen, Katie, thank you very much. As we have mentioned, this deadly police shooting comes four years after Moncton. So this city, this province, is coming to terms with how it happened again. I spoke with the Premier of New Brunswick, Brian Gallant, just a short time ago. Premier, thank you for joining us. We're terribly uh, sorry to be meeting like this. I, I know you've had a really long day and you've been out speaking with people in this community. W what are they asking you for? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, people are offering their condolences. Obviously, I think they're offering them to me so uh, I can pass them on to all New Brunswickers, to the city of Fredericton and to the Fredericton Police Force. Uh, people are also, of course, asking how this happened, why this happened. I know people want those answers and they'd like to have them as quickly as possible, but we ask for their patience so that we can allow the authorities to do the proper uh, steps to make sure that they alert the right people in the right sequence and, of course, so that they can undertake their investigation. And people are asking how the Fredericton police officers are doing. And obviously, I think it's uh, a very difficult day for them, to say the least. It was an absolute uh, senseless tragedy that they went through. And to see two of their colleagues uh, fall like they saw today, it, uh, it's a horrendous situation for all of them. Well, and now people can't talk about Fredericton without talking about Moncton. I mean, for a province to size to lose five police officers in, in, in four years, uh, what's, the, what's the tangible effect on New Brunswick? Well, there's no doubt that today's shooting will be compared to uh, the Moncton shooting. Um, I think that the two events are different, though. Um, they'll certainly have some similarities, but they are uh, two different events, and we can't treat them exactly the same. Uh, one thing that there's uh, no doubt that, that is, uh, is a reminder today, as it was four years ago when we saw the shootings in Moncton, it's a reminder of how important first responders are and how they sacrifice so much for all of us. Uh, not only should we think of that today on a very somber uh, and tragic event, uh, we should also think about that every single day of the year when people are putting their cells uh, in harm's way to keep us safe as Canadians. And that is one of the things people are talking to us about just as we arrive. You know, one gentleman saying, were they protected enough when they went in there? You know, did they have everything they needed? That's certainly a question for people here. W what's the question that's rattling around for you right now? Well, that's going to be uh, uh, something that's going to come up over the next few weeks and months. There's no doubt it came up during the Moncton shootings as well, and uh, people were still talking about it uh, over the last year. Uh, there'll be a time for those conversations right now. We want to make sure that we focus on the families of the victims, the community here, the greater community of Fredericton and all New Brunswickers that have gone through a tragic event and obviously have... Uh, have uh, a lot of work to do to get through this and, and make sure that we go through the grieving process. Okay, it's going to be a long night. Thank you, Premier. Thank you. So as the country grapples with another deadly shooting, people in Toronto are honouring the victims of last month's fatal attack on the Danforth. Well, Adrian, it's been nearly three weeks since 18-year-old Reese Fallon and 10-year-old Juliana Kozis were gunned down in one of Toronto's most vibrant neighbourhoods. And tonight, on those same streets, the city's annual Taste of the Danforth Food Festival is getting underway. The Prime Minister was there and addressed today's tragedy in Fredericton. As we uh, remember uh, the terrible tragedy that struck uh, two weeks ago, uh, the loss of life, the way the community came together, there is a great town uh, a few hours east of here, our friends in Fredericton, uh, who are going through a very, very difficult night. And if we could all send them our best love and our best support for our fallen officers uh, who are there protecting us and, uh, and the people who died in a terrible tragedy. Today's shooting hitting close to home in this Toronto neighborhood. It's the festival's 25th anniversary, but part of the opening ceremony tonight clearly felt the impact of last month's attack. A moment of silence was held in tribute to the lives lost on July 22nd. Time was also set aside to acknowledge the heroic efforts of first responders and many people in the neighborhood who rushed to help more than a dozen victims.
A lot more people will come just to show support for the taste of Danforth, for the community. As a city, we move forward and we celebrate um, our culture here and our different cultures. A benefit concert is being held tomorrow night with proceeds going towards hashtag Toronto Strong. And some survivors of last month's shooting are expected to attend the festival. People here are determined, they say, to not allow a singular act of violence to define their neighbourhood. For many in Greektown, taste of the Danforth is part of that normalcy. As for restaurant owners, tonight is all about bringing people back to the neighbourhood and showing that Toronto is indeed a safe place. We spoke with three of them as they prepared for one of the city's biggest street festivals. Well, we started at around 9 o'clock. We just come out here, set up everything. By 5 o'clock, we start bringing the meat outside. And by 6, we start selling it on the street. Now we're just starting the outside as the traffic stopped. So it's almost there. Put on the gyrus, start cooking. Started with shucking corn and uh, skewering some last souvlakis, although we've been doing that for a few days now. And now we just fired up the grills and now we're waiting for the people to come. I was here that night, yes. Originally, he looked like a normal person walking. I was thinking there was nothing going on, like, okay, somebody's walking. And since suddenly, he just pulls a gun and was shooting straight down to the to the area where I didn't know you want to cover yourself, you want to protect yourself and you look around if everything is okay and then if you are dealing in a place like having a restaurant, you're going to make sure also your clients are all okay. One of my waitresses came outside to see what was going on and she just started screaming and we got all the customers, she started yelling, whatever, and everybody sort of started running to the back and we sent them all into the basement, which we thought, we felt was the safest place for them as far as what was happening. That was it and then we just waited it out. We were lucky because we were closed that night, but obviously we know a lot of the businesses around. We all grew up in this neighborhood, so for us it was very uh, shocking and surreal. I feel safe, yeah, and I continue opening my patio and working here. I don't personally don't feel threatened or being afraid. We can't live in a bubble, so come out, enjoy yourself. Um, the city's provided a whole bunch of police and a whole bunch of things to, to do their best to protect us. I think that uh, that was a one-time event. Danforth remains safe, it remains strong. Come on down, there's nothing to worry about. It's going to be safe, lots of police out. It's going to be a good time. We are live here in the Vancouver newsroom with the latest on a bizarre story breaking just south of here near Seattle. An empty passenger plane stolen by a suicidal worker at SeaTac Airport. I want to show you some video here of the Horizon Airlines Q400. The plane was eventually followed by F-15 fighter jets. An eyewitness, Irvington Billsworth, was in Washington State. He told us that he saw this plane seconds before it crashed. So I seen the plane flying low. I'm like, ah, uh, maybe just left uh, the airport. So then I'm looking at him like, no, this is way too low. You see two jets flying, like following the plane. And literally, I walked behind a tree, and boom! And then as soon as I walked behind the tree, it hit, it hit an island. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department says the F-15s did not shoot down the plane, which did crash into Ketron Island near Seattle. Our next live update will be here on The National in about 20 minutes. We have much more special coverage ahead tonight from Fredericton. As the city gathers in grief this evening, there are still so many questions about what happened today and why and how. We will piece together how the horror unfolded moment by moment. But first, we'll take you to Charlottesville, Virginia, a city under a state of emergency tonight as it braces for a bleak anniversary, one year after a white nationalist rally turned deadly. I hate to even admit this, but we took the African-American students and the Jewish students who wished to go, and I hid them in the basement of my pavilion. There's a sense of unease in Charlottesville, Virginia tonight as it prepares to mark the anniversary of last year's violent rally by white supremacists. Extra police are on patrol and the city is in lockdown. A year ago Sunday, hundreds of far-right demonstrators gathered in Charlottesville, carrying torches and shouting racist and anti-Semitic slogans. One counter-protester was killed when the demonstration turned violent. Far-right groups plan to gather again, this time in the U.S. Capitol, but as Thomas Dagla reports, Charlottesville 
is still on edge. Reminders of history for some, symbols of oppression for others. Yes, those Confederate monuments still stand. With their muted expressions, they acted as a focal point of the anger that led to the chaos a year ago. Now they speak to the city's lingering unease. Until we can come up with usable solutions, then we'll never really move forward. Nearby, a sign Charlottesville is still grieving. Words and flowers in memory of Heather Heyer, the counter-protester run down a year ago on the street that now bears her name. As the anniversary of Heyer's death approaches, the memorial grows, and her allies worry about what's to come. I have gotten threats, um, you know, co almost constantly. Uh, I would say like at least three times a week. White supremacists canceled plans for an anniversary rally here, but police are bracing in case there's still trouble. Charlottesville is under a state of emergency for the weekend with no parking signs already up. In fact, no vehicle is being allowed into this area, the downtown core. Police are going to be monitoring everyone coming in and out. Weapons are banned, everything from bats to knives and paintball guns, everything but real guns. With the downtown around it shut, this flower shop will be open Sunday. The owner sees it as an act of defiance. Something horrible happened here, and we're not going to go run away and close our shops. Like, I'm going to be open, and I'm going to give out free flowers. Across town, the University of Virginia last year saw the infamous rally that started it all, with tiki torches lighting the statue of school founder Thomas Jefferson. This time, barricades form a maze on campus, and there's no getting close to that statue, a way to prevent the mayhem witnessed by Professor Larry Sabato. Hundreds and hundreds of young men praising Adolf Hitler and saying the most outrageous things. The memories still vivid. I hate to even admit this, but we took the African American students and the Jewish students who wished to go, and I hid them in the basement of my pavilion. Some are hopeful now that racism has been exposed here, it's being rooted out. This weekend will be a test of that. I get death threats every day. Um, we've had bomb threats at my daughter's school. I get people sending me crazy messages every day. It's difficult. The mud, the water's a little muddy, but before we can get to clean water, you got to go through the mud. The divisions here have deep roots, and they've been unearthed again for all to see. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, Charlottesville. As we mentioned, the Unite the Right group has canceled their rally in Charlottesville on Sunday. They're holding it in Washington instead. They plan to march in Lafayette Square, right across the street from the White House. The U.S. National Park Service has granted them a permit, allowing up to 400 people to take part. Former Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard David Duke is among those scheduled to speak. Federal officials have also given permission for two counter-protests to take place. Ahead tonight on The National, new mothers are warned about the risk of postpartum depression, but tonight there are calls to warn fathers as well. We'll look at the research and the recommendations. First, though, we'll have more special coverage from Fredericton, where the community has really come together tonight to try and heal, most importantly, to support one another. They're also getting support from across this country with people sharing their thoughts with the hashtag Fredericton Strong. On such a sad and dark day, we wanted to show our support with some pretty flowers and some kind words for the people who keep us safe. We owe them our gratitude for their sacrifice. New Brunswickers are mourning with you. Sending thoughts and prayers from Ontario to the people of Fredericton. Fredericton, Fredericton strong. strong. As mayor, is something I never want to have to live through. I have. I am. We are. But as I said, we will get through this together. And that is Fredericton Mayor Mike O'Brien really putting to words the thoughts of his city tonight after a morning of violence that left four people dead, two of them police officers just trying to protect and defend their community, their home. As this community tries to go to sleep tonight, let's remind you of what they woke up to those four tense hours this morning. Here's what we know about the shooting precisely as it unfolded. 
I was woke up at 7.07 this morning by shots. It sounded like they were coming out directly from my outside of my bedroom window. Just after 7 a.m., a call went out to Fredericton Police. Shots had been fired. At 7.10, two officers responded to this apartment complex. It has four buildings, A, B, C, and D. All the gunfire, says one witness, happened around building C. When those officers arrived, they found two bodies, and that's when the shooting started again. How long did it last? I want to say like 15, 20 minutes, and then it stopped for a while. Then the first public warning from police, avoid Brookside Drive because of an ongoing incident. Six minutes later, a more direct warning, lock your doors. More shots followed on and off. The police uh, was telling everybody to stay low and away from your windows. John Gibbons, from his home near those buildings, saw this, an armored vehicle with heavily armed officers. Three of them went into the building, and then I believe then the tear gas started. I imagine they were flushing them out. At 8.17 a.m., the first few tragic details trickled in from police, multiple fatalities. Then a little more specific, at least four people killed. At the same time, police were going door to door, combing through other apartments. The police came in about uh, 8.30 or so and searched my apartment. I, I knew they were coming because I heard them banging on doors, so I had all my closet doors open for them and stuff so they could go through my apartment quickly and carry on with their search. Some residents were cleared out and soon police moved in. Around 9.30, Fredericton police force entered an apartment and arrested a 48-year-old man from Fredericton. He was taken to the Dr. Edward Chalmers Hospital and is undergoing treatment for serious injuries. 45 minutes later, that final tragic detail from police of the dead, two were their own. Finally, just after 11 a.m., the lockdown was lifted. So I'm joined now by David McCubrey, who you saw in that piece just now. David, we know you live in this complex behind us. Uh, you've been out of it all day. How are you tonight? Tired. It's been a long day. Uh, not the best day, obviously, so uh, I'm, I'm making it through. You woke up with a heck of a start this morning. Can you give us a sense of what stands out for you the most about what you went through today? Uh, the most I went through was just, uh, I mean, just sitting there on my floor going, I, I can't believe this is going on in my city. It's a beautiful city. Uh, it's a very peaceful city, and it's not something you'd ever expect to wake up to in Fredericton. What did, what did you see that, that still rattles around for you? Well, at one point, I, I thought that, it, that there hadn't been shots for about half an hour or so, or 20 minutes, or whatever it was. And uh, I seen that the, in the courtyard behind us, uh, I seen that they, that they had the armor truck out, so, and the cop was standing there. So I thought, well, maybe it's over with. I hadn't heard anything for a while. So I snuck my window open just so I could hear, just to see something going on. I was still being cautious, but it, I don't know if it was fate or something. As soon as I opened that window, the shots started flying again, and I, they sounded like they were coming right from almost below my window, and that was the only time I felt frightened, but I thought, well, I better get away from this window, so then I felt bad for the cops, so I kind of <clears throat> lifted my head to see if the cop was okay. He seemed like he was still standing there, and I slammed my window shut and crawled back into my kitchen kitchen floor so you were telling me earlier <coughs> you have in your apartment right now there there's a meat cleaver standing by what why was that I had a meat cleaver and a hammer sitting there because <clears throat> you just see these things on the American news you know they can go wrong if somebody tries to get in your house and whatnot but they weren't gonna be coming into my house so I but was doing sure I was gonna protect myself I actually wanted to go out and help but I knew that wouldn't help make the situation any better yeah. what did you mean help I want to go out and to try and stop the person from doing this. You know, I knew people were dying out there and it, it was upsetting me. I, I can imagine, and I know it's still upsetting you. There are questions so many people have tonight. Mm -hmm. what, what's the question that's really bothering you the most? I just, I don't know if it's a question or a thought. I, I just can't believe this is what our world's coming to now. It's, it seems like every other week, we're having a shooting either going on in the States. It now seems to be spreading up into Canada. We had one down in the Danforth a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, and now this here in Fredericton. It just, I just wish it would stop. And you're not alone in that. I hope you get a good night's sleep, okay? Thank you. Okay. There is a moment we'd really like to show you now. It's a quiet moment uh, we captured outside the police headquarters here in Fredericton. <laughs> Yeah. 
It's a tribute from a fellow first responder. This paramedic walked up to the growing memorial. He opened up his violin case, just started playing. We will hear from him a little later on The National. We are live on The National with the latest on the crash tonight of a stolen Horizon plane with no passengers aboard. A 29-year-old airline mechanic described by police as suicidal took off from SeaTac Airport in Seattle, just south of Vancouver. F-15 fighter jets were scrambled but we're told did not shoot the plane down. Here's Pierce County Sheriff. Those terrorists don't uh, do loops um, uh, over, uh, over the water. Um, so um, there's no indication there was a terrorist act, an attempt to attack. Uh, this might have been a joyride gone terribly wrong. And let's take a look at some uh, video of the plane before it crashed in Ketron Island near Seattle. Police have no indication that anyone else was hurt when it did crash. We've all heard of postpartum depression affecting new mothers, but according to new research, it's an issue for some fathers as well. It's one of the topics highlighted at this week's American Psychological Association conference. As Cass Rusi tells us, many fathers are reluctant to admit they need help. Hey. <laughs> Come on, you can do the smiles. Hi. <laughs> First-time father Eric Gite is spending some quality time with five-month-old son Oliver. Good for dad and good for mom, who's back at the house getting a much-needed nap. I don't think she got very much sleep last night, so trying to let her have a few minutes alone. For most parents, having a baby is cause for celebration, but it can also be a stressful time. And not just with moms. New fathers, too, can experience some form of depression after their baby's born. It's not exactly clear what causes it, but roughly 10% of new dads experience postpartum depression, and research shows it can linger for up to six months after the birth of a child. Fathers will also experience depression differently than mothers, says this U.S.-based psychologist. Many times they'll experience it in what's called um, male-masked depression. So symptoms of anger, frustration, irritability, as well as uh, social isolation, increase in substance use. Singley says postpartum depression in fathers has been a long overlooked public health issue. There's so little information about it. Nobody really gets training about the father's role in the reproductive mental health process. Yes. But in Toronto, a father's mental health program has been assessing new fathers for any early signs of depression since 2014. Helping them understand what it is they're struggling with in that moment, uh, providing them a lot of education, uh, one that may help them to kind of in some sense normalize their experience, let them know they're not alone with this. New dad Eric Gite says he's a little sleep deprived, but that's about it. Still, he was glad when a midwife checked up on him during one of his wife's appointments. When Sarah had to go and do a test, the midwife would always uh, just sort of have take a minute and ask how I'm doing. New fathers aren't usually checked for signs of depression, but in the U.S., psychologists are calling for regular screening of new and expectant fathers, hoping to detect any signs of depression. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, what does it take to save a TV show? We'll look at how millions of fans are banding together to keep their favorites on the air. To see so many young adults, um, you know, put their passion into action and uh, push forward such a highly coordinated effort, I think, for me personally, it gives me hope just for the future in general, TV aside, you know. Concentrated UV rays. Even more intense than sunlight. <laughs> Suspense, action, romance, all in a supernatural realm. That's the TV series Shadow Hunters in a nutshell. It's a formula that's won at a die-hard teenage fan base, and that base is now stepping up, fighting tooth and nail after news broke that 
the series was getting canceled. And it's not just Shadowhunters. The entire genre is seeing that extraordinary level of support. As Deanna Sumanag Johnson tells us, it has paid off and kept some shows on the air. Shadowhunters is a fantasy series about vampires, werewolves, and warlocks. But when its fans found out it was cancelled earlier this summer, it inspired some very real action. I've got a demon to hunt. Save Shadowhunters hashtag was used in more than 15 million tweets. Fans paid for signs on London buses and billboards in Times Square and Toronto. We built a, a little piece of New York City on our stage. Canadian Chris Hatcher is one of the producers of Shadowhunters. He knows the show's Toronto set like the back of his hand. Streets, restaurants and apartments loved by the fans now stand empty. It definitely came as a shock to everybody, you know. Ultimately it was a business decision that was, uh, was made at a, at a high level. At the moment, there appear to be no plans to renew Shadowhunters, but you can see why the fans would be hopeful. The viewers of so-called genre television, science fiction, fantasy and horror have recently been particularly successful in rescuing the shows they love. The plan is if you guys see any of those things down there, you run. The Expanse, a critically acclaimed show that takes place in space, got cancelled, then picked up for another season earlier this summer after an ambitious fan campaign. This stuff's kind of cool. Both of these shows are filmed in Canada, now the go-to place for the crews who know their stuff with props, set design and prosthetics essential to genre television. They've also mastered the magic formula, one part escapism, one part relatability, says this TV writer. I think it all comes down to creating a world that people want to engage with and it's something, something that's outside of the normal. That sense of being in an alternate realm while also still delivering relatable characters and relatable scenarios. With Shadowhunters, for example, what fans like Maria Jose Garcia rave about is idea. its portrayal of same-sex relationships. There's uh, some characters that are gay, um, bisexual, uh, lesbian, like all these different um, sexualities, but those qualities never define them as characters. But even with all that, a show's future in the competitive television landscape is always uncertain. For the Shadowhunters Toronto producer, there are rewards, even if the show is not extended. Among other things, the fans donated $20,000 to a suicide prevention project for LGBT youth, something they felt was in the spirit of the show. To see so many young adults, um, you know, put their passion into action and... Uh, push forward such a highly coordinated effort, I think, for me personally, it gives me hope just for the future in general, TV aside, you know. Shadowhunters fans will have something to feast on no matter the outcome of their campaign. Ten more episodes of the show plus a two-hour finale have yet to air on Netflix. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, we'll have more from Adrian in Fredericton. First, though, a reminder about our newsletter, The National Today, takes you inside our journalism in the afternoon. It goes deeper on some of our top stories and highlights stories you may have missed. Today was the controversial comments by Boris Johnson that could see Britain's former foreign secretary booted out of his own Conservative Party. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. Well, here's some video of that Horizon Airlines plane with a suicidal airline mechanic at the controls. It was taken earlier this evening. The 29-year-old stole the plane from SeaTac Airport. We were listening to his radio transmissions to air traffic control, and he did sound deeply troubled. The plane did go down a short time after that south of Seattle. And here's what one of the witnesses, Irvington Billsworth, said happened. So I've seen the plane flying low. Oh, my God. Maybe just left uh, the airport. So then I'm looking at him like, no, this is way too low. I see two jets flying, like following the plane. And literally I walked behind a tree, and boom. And then as soon as I walked behind the tree, it hit, it hit an island. And let's take a closer look at the crash site tonight. This is Ketron Island, not too far from Seattle. Eyewitnesses uh, saying that they could feel the ground shake. Authorities say this is a heavily wooded island. There are no structures there that they know of. And for this entire incident, although the pilot, of course, presumed to have died in this, there are no reports, indeed no expectation, that anyone else 
was injured in this incident. We will, of course, stay on top of these developments on CBC News and cbcnews.ca. In moments of grief, it is really hard to find the right words. And that was certainly the case for one man as he stood outside the growing memorial in Fredericton today. So instead, he did what he could. He turned to music. Brian Fournier is a paramedic with Ambulance New Brunswick, and he decided to take out his violin and just play. We spoke to him as he started his shift this evening, and this is our moment. I just wanted to offer my support um, in any way, any way I could. I put the cards down in front of the, uh, in front of everybody else's flowers and things like that. And I just took it, took the violin out and decided to play something that was on my mind. My, my best friends are our first responders. So uh, when something like this happens, it really feels like uh, a piece of your family is, is, is torn away. Whether it's fire, paramedics or police, we uh, were really out there for the public and uh, we really, really, really appreciate your support. It's a very sad situation, but I know we'll get through it because Fredericton is very strong. I really love my 911 family and I'm really, really thankful for the uh, unbreakable bond we all share together. So people propping each other up, uh, again, we go back to that, that scene at the hospital today with all those officers standing there, uh, waiting for the chief, standing with each other, the people of Fredericton standing shoulder to shoulder. Uh, again, these, you know, these echoes of the Danforth, uh, certainly echoes of, of Moncton. I, I remember that memorial with all of those officers and everyone is thinking about Moncton today. I, and to that end, I'd, I'd kind of like to show you uh, an editorial drawing today done by the great uh, Michael de Adder. Uh, I think we have it for you. It, it's of, obviously, an RCMP uh, officer with his uh, arm around a Fredericton police officer. This is, uh, this is really what's in people's minds today, Ian. You know, one of the people you talked to during the program, David, who lives in that apartment complex, you could hear his despair as he, he looked at all of these shootings, Danforth, Moncton, uh, Fredericton, of course, and, and he's looking for answers. And hopefully we start to get those answers very soon. Our journalism is moving forward on that, on things like motive. Well, we'll keep trying. That is The National for Friday, August the 10th. Good night.